Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the United Methodist Church. It's a beautiful day, bright day, soon to be a very warm day. And uh, our hope and prayer is that we are all doing well and also that we are going to be here all together to lift out our voices. Praise God and God in every respect. So I want to, uh, first of all, uh, recognize our first time visitors here in our church. If there is any first time visitor here with us today, we would like to use this opportunity to hand you a most, the most delightful piece of bread you have ever treated in your life and that has been made by one of our members of the congregation. So if there is a uh, first time visitor here, would you please raise your hand and let us know that you are here. And also for the pastor to do. Okay. I see no hand, so. And for every, everyone who is here today, you are more than welcome to be here in the presence of God. I want to go to the announcements page in our bulletin uh, and uh, to tell you what's going on in, in our membership um, in the last week. So, the flowers in our pocket are given to the glory of God in loving memory of her husband, Bob Beeson, for the anniversary of the 21st of this month and his birthday on the 26th from Charlene Beeson. Also, the flowers in the lectern are given to the glory of God and in honor of Mr. Wyatt Rosenberger, who is turning nine years old today. Uh, we want to express our sympathy to the family of Ms. Kathleen Gilman uh, on her death uh, earlier last week. And uh, in terms of uh, people who are now in the hospital or in rehab, uh, we were informed last night that Jamie Childers has been admitted to uh, that but this in East, uh, he was taken from the doctor's office and admitted to the hospital. Uh, so please give uh, Jamie your prayers. And also, uh, we want to lift up Russell Palmer, who is in Unity Hospital. Uh, someone asked me earlier where Unity Hospital is. I don't know if I want to be great about that. Uh, so also, uh, this is in terms of announcements regarding our membership. I also want to bring you up to this week's opportunities at the church. Uh, tonight, we will have the uh, youth uh, big picture night. So all the youth are invited to be part of this uh, yearly event that takes place in, in the life of the youth uh, family, which is a, a great event for them. It's in the beginning of the new year, and they are all eager So tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a planning meeting for the blessing of the animals at 6 o'clock in Larry Jason's office. Uh, so all of those who want to be part of this planning meeting are invited to come at 6 o'clock tomorrow at Larry Jason's office for the uh, planning meeting for the blessing of the animals. Uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, starting this past Wednesday, uh, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, the Pastor Bible uh, study started. So, uh, I just want to tell you to be aware that this is going on right now in the life of the church. Um, and also, on Wednesdays, uh, of course, uh, our Wednesday meetings are already uh, taking place. So, 5 o'clock the Wednesday, Wednesday after that, you are all invited to come here to the sanctuary uh, for the devotion that takes place every Wednesday evening. Uh, we know more announcements or news in the life of the church. Start for us to
thank you for this day with which you have graced us. We thank you for its beauty. We thank you for it serving as a reminder of you giving to us precisely what we need and, and when we need it. That all things are within your power. <coughs> all things are within your control. And that you send to us not only grace upon grace, you send to us goodness upon goodness, and you remind us always and everywhere of your unfailing affection for us. God, we are grateful for all of these gifts and for every gift that we receive from you day by day. Each is an expression of your perfect love. The Lord is also an expression of your perfect love know that we can come to you with those things that burden us. We can come to you. We are invited to come to you with those things that press down upon us. So we live to you in this hour. We live to you in this space. The various concerns that we have carried into this worship on this day. So for the names, for the needs written on the cards in this bowl, for the names, for the needs that are written on our hearts. For God, we lift them to you. We entrust them to you. And we pray for you, knowing that you will move in every situation and circumstance according to your perfect will and your perfect time. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be those who would be ambassadors to your good news, to your gospel, such that whenever there is someone near to us, whenever we find a neighbor, whenever we find a friend, whenever we find Lord in a stranger who is hurt, who is struggling, who is suffering, who is unsure, that you would help us to reach out to them in ways that convey your goodness, your compassion, your forgiveness, and your love. All of these things we pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples how to pray. So we join our voices with the voices of those first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Hear the plea of your servant, 
and of your people Israel when they pray towards his place. O oh, here in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays towards his house, then here in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. The word of God for the people of God. The epistle reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, which will be able to punch all the flaming arrows of the evil one, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that, the, to that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak a message, may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may be able to declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I want to invite the children to join me sharing for the children's message.
So I think that as we go about our days and our weeks, we need to remember Jesus' attitude and try to have our attitude match that. And Jesus' attitude was nice and kind and caring and giving. And so the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you in your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. And so I think that if we all remember Jesus' attitude, and we all live our lives with an attitude of sharing the love of Jesus and God, then we will all be better people, and none of our parents will have to say, now that I'm sharing, I think you need an attitude adjustment this morning. Because even if Sherry sometimes needs to adjust her attitude. And so whenever that happens, I think of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
give us everything already. And now, when the time arrives for us to give back to you your offerings, we want you to bless this offering to Lord. And we ask you to allow us to spread your word all around the world, even when the world is here amongst us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank this year he talked about attitude, the attitude of Jesus is of love and kindness. And therefore, we have every reason in the world to trust our Lord. As we sing this morning, uh, number, hymn, uh, hymn number 462, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. <laughs> Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? 
It is the spirit that gives life. Flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. You know, one thing I discovered while serving in pastoral ministry is that it is nearly impossible to maintain a clean email email. And I do try. But for every message that I delete, it seems like ten more come tumbling in. Most are important, of course, having to do with something relevant to the church, to its life, to its ministry. But some are straight up junk. For instance, I know for a fact that my mom is not stranded in the Philippines and needing me to wire her 50 grand. I know that. So I do my best to sort and to file that junk mail, but those of the latter type, outside of the occasional chuckle, are soon forgotten. There's one email, though, that I think I may always remember. It wasn't junk, at least. In fact, it was forwarded to me a couple of years ago by an individual who had recently become involved with the United Methodist Church. But the email originated from a person in her former denomination. Now she left that church for some very specific reasons, and she stated at the time that she felt peace in the United Methodist Church, that she felt at home in the United Methodist Church, as if God had, as if God had sent her. But the email, instead of thanking God for this, was harshly critical of our denomination, denigrating its history, denigrating its polity, its style of worship, even its name, essentially saying that it is not part of Christ's church. Now, to read such things, it, it, it obviously upset me. It obviously hurt me deeply, but, but it made me hurt even more for this person. Because she had been so happy. She had been so ecstatic to find a, a, a church home. She was, she was filled with such joy that now she was being told, now she was being told by this person in her former church that she had made a grievous mistake. Now, it's no secret. It's no secret that such contentious attitudes are too frequently present between Christian denominations. And I would say that's the primary reason that so many different denominations exist. Sometimes these attitudes are quite easy to identify, as was the case in that email. Sometimes they're more subtle, unspoken, or just under the surface. But they're there all the same. Prejudices, misapprehensions, hastily formed opinions, often based not on experience, based not on research, but on little more than hearsay. Well, I heard this group does that. I heard of that. And it's that same sort, I think, it's that same sort of, of surface level understanding which caused so many folks to take flight when Jesus taught. 
In today's gospel reading, Jesus is continuing his exposition on the bread from heaven. We've heard a lot about bread over the last several years. But Jesus is continuing that exposition here. But in this morning's lesson, his discourse kind of takes a turn that his listeners find more than slightly unsettling. When Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I am them, and whoever eats me will live forever because of me. Now, we hear this far removed from its first sharing, and it may not strike us as particularly off-putting. After all, whenever we gather for the Eucharist, we ask God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to make the bread, to make the cup, Christ's body and blood, to make them re-presentations of that sacrificial offering made by Christ for us. Don't do it. Now we understand, of course, that we are not eating literal flesh. We're not eating literal blood. But we're partaking of elements that, that mysteriously, that somehow make Christ present and point us toward Christ. If, however, we try to hear Jesus' words with 21st century ears, we might find ourselves just as befuddled as those to whom he spoke. They can't wrap their minds around what he's saying. They call it difficult. The Greek is skleros, which means offensive or intolerable. And they characterize it in this way because what Jesus is telling them to do is forbidden. What Jesus is telling them to do is against the rules. It, it, it's against the law. It violates the Torah because as the life of any creature, blood is sacred to God. And so they're disgusted by what Jesus is saying, not only because of this notion of of eating flesh and blood, which is icky enough, but also because of the thought, the, the, the very thought, the very notion of breaking God's law. And the scripture tells us that many of his disciples, not just a handful, not just a few, many of his disciples turned back no longer went with him. And still it's the exchange between Jesus and twelve that I find most relevant for our consideration today. Because after the other disciples had gone, Jesus asked the apostles if they also wanted to speak. Peter is often portrayed as the group's spokesperson answers, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the eternal one, the holy one of God. Ah, Peter. He didn't always get it right. But here, he hits the nail on the head. But it's important for us to understand, I think, that in terms of the religious landscape, the time and place that Jesus and his contemporaries occupied was not much different from our own. That is to say, it, it wasn't as if Jesus was the only game in town. Myriad views of the divine existed and, and intermingled and not always peaceably. Indeed, Jesus' teachings represented just one set among many. 
There were scholars before him and after who claimed to have, have special knowledge of the divine or, or insights to the things of God. And a lot of these voices were overlapping, each claiming to have the truth or, or some special take on the truth. And this is what makes Peter's realization all the more poignant, all the more important for us to hear, because he recognizes Christ for who he is, not because Christ was the only game in town, but in the midst of competing religious ideologies. And he identifies Christ. He identifies Christ.
because I feel that it best points me toward the one who does have the answers. Out of all of the religious landscape that exists, out of all the options that are out there, for me, this is the vehicle that carries me closest to the one who does have the answers. The one who is true. The one in whom the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. I choose Methodism because it points me the one who has the words of eternal life. And in the final analysis, it is only this one. It is only the Christ, only his ways that we're beckoning to follow. It's for this reason that I am I am very leader of any individual or any organization that claims such exclusive possession of what's true or such exclusive knowledge of what isn't. Which, of course, doesn't mean that we can't take lessons from others or, or learn from their examples. But, but no human being, not one of us, grasps the entirety of the mind of God. No human being, not one of us, grasps the entirety of the will of God. And to say that we can, to say that we do, is beyond short-sighted. It is woefully arrogant. And it's ultimately destructive. Because my God is much, much bigger than that. I can admire John Wesley. I can admire his teachings, which I do greatly. I have paintings of Mr. Wesley all over my office, even a John Wesley bottle. Paper. Stop by sometime, I'll show you. But even Mr. Wesley's teachings aren't the end all be all. They're not. Others might look to the patristics, or they might look to Luther, or they might look to Calvin, or, or other forebears of the faith. They might look to contemporary teachers like, like Martin Luther King. They might look to Billy Graham. They might even look to Joyce Meyer. But the same is true for them. It's true for them. Even the greatest Christian thinkers, even the greatest Christian leaders have struggled to comprehend fully what St. Paul calls the mystery of the gospel. Still others might stay closer to home, patterning their faith after their parents, or after their grandparents, after siblings, or friends, or, or even a pastor or a respected figure. But St. Peter correctly said that those who would be Christ's disciples can go nowhere else. They can go to no one else. Because when all is said and done, it is Christ who is the source of truth. It is Christ who has and who speaks the words of life. Which again means that no one has every answer. I don't. And neither do you. None of us get it right at every turn and way. And because that's the case, no one can rightly claim that their belief or their practice or their way of thinking is superior to anyone else's. No person can, no congregation can, no denomination can, no tradition can. And for this reason, it does us very little good caught up in arguing over who's right and who's wrong and straining over the excruciating minutia of every doctor, of every doctor. It does very good. It is far more beneficial to ask instead whether one is earnestly striving to follow this Christ. This one who not only tells us but also shows us through his life and through his death and through his resurrection that our most pressing responsibility is not to be right nor to prove who is wrong, but to love God and to love our neighbor.
Because whatever else we may think is true, whatever else we may agree or disagree upon, this is the mark of the true Christian. And this is the key to living abundantly and to living eternally. To whom can we go? Only to Christ, who feeds us with heaven's bread and calls everyone to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, we have our response to the word. May we join our voices together in the affirmation of faith, which can be found in the United Methodist Hymnal on page 881. Page 881. And let us join our voices together, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, as we always do, we extend to you this invitation, Christian disciples. If you're here this morning and you have heard Jesus speaking something to you, perhaps that you have never heard before, you have heard the, the Spirit of God whispering in that still small voice to your spirit, saying, Come and follow me. I invite you to respond. By coming to this chancel rail as we sing our closing hymn, by coming to, to kneel and to pray, or, or by responding from exactly where you are, precisely where you are, by opening your heart, by opening your life to the God who formed you and the God who now met you. Perhaps you have been on that path of discipleship, but you know that you have veered from that path or, or strayed from that path. We all have. We pass through various seasons our lives, sometimes closer to God, sometimes farther away. But if you hear this morning and that is your experience, I likewise invite you to come and to pray, or to pray from right where you are, inviting God to, to resume the direction of your life. These invitations are open now as we stand and sing our closing hymn together.
gifts of bread and wine, your Holy Spirit, that they might be made for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes and plan the victory, and we feast his heavenly name. Amen. Now, dear friends, receive these words of benediction and of blessing. Children of God, go forth in peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son.